With us today is Richard Giordano, and Richard is raised on the south side of Chicago. We won't hold that so against him. So don't mess with him. Don't we, mess won't hold it, we won't hold that against him. <laughs> Richard has a master's degree in educational administration, doctoral degree in education with the University of Colorado, and he developed his make-up crap synergistic thinking mythology while working as a high school principal. And we'll Very probably cool. find out what all that's about later. <laughs> I'm sure. He, he, he is authored a book called Supercharged Learning, How Wacky Thinking and Sports Psychology Make It Happen. But he also happens to be an authority on marijuana and the teenage brain, a topic we've talked about a lot here. On I'm, I'm not sure action. about that authority part, but I know some stuff about it. Okay, So, <laughs> so between you, his... Mike, and I, we know a lot. Well, well, there, there's the authority. <laughs> we're going to have fun, right? <laughs> so welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank it's you very nice much. nice to have you here. And you, you, we were talking earlier, you drove from Colorado because you like uh, watching the scenery outside yeah, of the car. I, I, like, I like to drive. I do. Yeah. Now, I... Uh, Carl, one of the owners here, was asking you that he said that was a long drive, and I was sitting there kind of smiling. And he asked me if I'd done anything like that. And I told him, "Well, yeah, I've driven all the way from Alaska to California and back." So, yeah, right. I did. A, I did the New York thing. Yeah, yes, and Canada and all that. So, yeah, yeah. We, so, we all like driving, so all, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. A lot of fun. Very. Cool. How about you? Did you drive that yet? I went to Santa Monica over the weekend. Uh, <laughs> I figured he was going to say Mammoth or something. I think that pales in comparison, but, you know, it was good you were behind yeah, the he's, wheel. He's, he's right there with us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just you guys are on macro scale. Shorter, yeah. shorter version, that's all. Shorter version. Yeah. But you yeah. enjoy driving, don't you? I dig it. Yeah. yeah. It clears my mind sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. The unfortunate thing is a lot of the other drivers on the road drive as if they got their driver's license out of a Cheerios box, and that's getting to be less and less pleasant out there. But other than that. You know, but just, I mean, just not to change the subjects or anything, but I see, and just on the on the streets, I don't know about you guys, I'm seeing a lot more people that are intoxicated driving than ever before. I mean, I'm noticing it. Like crazy on the freeway, I'm seeing people. I mean, it's on the streets. It's just been really kind of crazy. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know why, but I, I'm telling you, I'm seeing a spike in it. Well, personally, just, just trying to get out you, of the. Park. Are you seeing that, or am I crazy? I think or am I just it, the I, only one? I think what you might be seeing is the effects of of using the phone while driving. That could uh, be it, it too. It's synonymous to to driving yeah. intoxicated. It yeah. really is. No, I think it's almost worse. I flip the phone on airplane mode and I'm gone until I until I reach where I'm going. I don't. Good for you. You know, because yeah. yeah. I'm seeing people all over the map. I mean, they're like from mm-hmm. lane to lane, and it's mm-hmm. like whoa. If I could edge in here, I'll tell you that coming from Colorado, where it's been legal now for a while, mm-hmm. uh, I know some EMTs in the southern part of the state who tell me that they roll on a lot of different accidents, many fatals, <laughs> and the smell of marijuana is pervasive. Yes, yeah, that's what so, we're hearing. So that is uh, that's a form of intoxication that uh, needs to be brought into the discussion. Yeah. Boy, I'll say. Yeah, no, absolutely. Go ahead. I've got three action items Let's here. Let's do that, Gary, and then we'll jump going. right and, into... Uh, and uh, uh, well, our guest, please, uh, Richard, jump in if, if, you feel, if you feel the move. <laughs> All right? This is interesting, Carrie, and we could take credit for this. But I'm sure it's not because of us, but, you know, we had uh, Mir Smythe with us last Monday, and we, we were did. talking about the fact that the, although the state of California has legalized marijuana, the city of Santa Clarita is taking a 10-month moratorium where they're going to look at it and decide what they may or may not want to do along those lines. Right. And, and it was a great conversation, but this was interesting. Tuesday, the day following that, Los Angeles County supervisors voted unanimously to extend an existing ban on mar- medical and recreational marijuana in unincorporated county territory. And that's two weeks after city uh, Santa Clarita decided to, do, to put it on hold. So the measure means that, and by the way, this was brought forward by Supervisor uh, Catherine Barger, who we've had on we the had show. We had on the before. show. We did. Super lady. She re- yeah. represents the 5th District, which includes Santa Clarita Valley. And this is a extending indefinitely pending the county's adoption of comprehensive regulatory framework for pot. The ordinance bans the cultivation, manufacturing, processing, transportation, and retail sale of medical and non-medical marijuana in any unincorporated territory of Los Angeles County. Wow. Thank you very much. 
Isn't that something? Well, that that would have been something that should have been done in Colorado. There's a county in Colorado, Sawatch County, where it is just proliferating, and it is literally destroying the night sky with all the lights coming out of these greenhouses. Really? Water wow. tables being depleted, violated codes. Uh, and they, the law enforcement wow. in uh, that particular county does not have the re- does not have the resources. And there, I don't know that there's the will because that that lure of a lot of money is very powerful. You, you know what, Richard? It's, it's, I think as a society, we almost gave up when it comes to marijuana. I'm hearing this, which is different, so that's exciting. But parents aren't really jumping on it like they used to. Kids are getting more and more in trouble. By the time we get them, they're a lot more in trouble than they were when we were getting them a year ago. School districts are, are more lax, not ours, but lots of them. The police are not, I mean, nobody kind of knows what direction to yeah. even go yeah, right well, now. Let's hope that this kind of show can help provide some direction. Exactly. And and we're not even, I'm not even going to take a stand one way or the other if it should be legal or not. I mean, I own drug rehab, so legalize it. It helps me. Hmm which is, I hate to say that, but that's the way it is. It doesn't help me with kids because unfortunately, parents aren't doing anything about it. But as soon as they hit 18, 19, and they go on to other different and better drugs, our adult programs are getting pretty full. So, and you can really, you can really put it right back to why they're, they're not getting dealt with early. So now they're in trouble later. So it's 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 pretty scary what's going on with adolescents right now, and and I'm, I know you want to do do your thing, and then we'll. Yeah, well, this this just adds to because we talk about marijuana being a gateway drug all the time, and here's a story: overdose cases spike in Louisville, fifty two calls in thirty two hours. This was a jump, big jump, over twenty five overdose calls received in the same thirty two hour time frame last week. Mm. And this is what they're talking about, clusters. Across the country, there are clusters. Such overdose clusters pop up in different spots, and authorities aren't sure why. I'm pretty sure why. In Cuyahoga County, Ohio, which includes Cleveland, at least 14 people died of opioid overdoses over one weekend this month. Already this year, more than 60% of the autopsies conducted in the coroner's office in Montgomery County, Ohio, which includes Dayton, involved drug overdose deaths. Nationwide, the spike in opioid overdoses is blamed on heroin and fentanyl. Death rates from synthetic opioids, including fentanyl, increased 72.2% from 2014 to 2015. And that's according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. See, it's it's all about the batches of heroin that's coming in and, and how it's cut. And I'll tell you what, the dealers don't even know. They're getting the stuff and all they're being told is it's real strong stuff. Be careful. And then when, when addicts, I did this on the news, actually. When addicts hear, oh, my, there's some really potent stuff, they go running for it because it's just stronger and better. And then they figure, well, I'll just use a little bit less than normal. And that little bit of less still is enough to kill you so when it's cut with fentanyl and other stuff like that you don't know what's going on it's really russian roulette i was speaking to a girl today on the way here she's actually pregnant and uh, wants to detox and she said it's russian roulette i know it's russian roulette. every time i shoot dope i don't know for sure if i'm gonna live or not and she says now i have a baby so I really have to pay attention. And you're looking surprised. I deal with this all the time. It's sad. Mm. So, yeah, it's really Russian roulette right now. And, and we are having an epidemic. And it's worse than it was in the 70s. And it's killing more people than car crashes and gun violence. And if it was car crashes or gun violence that was killing these many people, imagine if gun violence took 53 people in, in 30 hours. It would be mainstream media. Everybody would be screaming. They would. Hey, even, even in Chicago. Even in Chicago, they'd be screaming. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, we better start screaming. We better start paying attention to what's going on out there. We're losing good people that are making bad choices. Well, the next action item I have is, is very interesting. This falls under the heading, I think, of um, creative and a good idea. And this was Doritos, or excuse me, Tostitos. Tostitos. They partnered with Mothers Against Drunk Driving and Uber to create alcohol sensor bags. 
Now, they were at the Super Bowl. They didn't advertise, but they were available at the Super Bowl. And here's the thing. They're not available in grocery stores right now. But the bag of Tostitos is not a breathalyzer, and it won't give you an exact measurement of your blood alcohol level. Instead, it looks at traces of adult beverages in your breath. A sensor at the top of the bag measures your breath, while lights below the logo flash the results. Isn't that cool? If the bag doesn't detect alcohol, the front will light up green. If alcohol alcohol is present, then the front of the bag will flash a red steering wheel and a don't drink and drive message along the bottom. The front will also flash an Uber code that you can use to get a discount for an Uber ride to help you get home. And while the concept of the chip bag that senses alcohol is neat, the police uh, note that if you have to blow into a Tostitos bag to know if you're intoxicated, for the love of all that's holy, do not drive. Uh, you're probably... <laughs> Drunk. <laughs> is that nationally available now? I don't think it is. And people, I mean, immediately people were wondering if uh, if it was available in grocery stores, but it isn't. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but I think it's a great idea. I really do. It's it's definitely pretty interesting. That's for sure. Hey, on that note, why don't we just go right in? Let's let's go into our show. You got it all here. Let's do it, Mike. Let's talk about that. Now, you have two things going on here that you probably want to talk about. One is your book, Supercharged Learning: How Wacky Thinking and Sports Psychology Make It Happen. And uh, the other is, uh, we definitely want you to talk about uh, the teenage brain and marijuana. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, uh, uh, Mike, because they, they dovetail. The book, Supercharged Learning, which, by the way, the foreword is written by Dr. Ben Carson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, think we're, uh, I think we know where he stands on, on drugs. We do. Um, the book is all about trying to help parents help their children learn. Um, I was a high school principal for many years. I taught uh, biological sciences, physical sciences, chemistry, physics. Uh, I coached uh, basketball and track at the middle level. And uh, my interest in marijuana at this stage of where I am has to do with what it does to the learning process, right. how it impedes, stops, uh, abrogates the learning process in young children. And I don't hear this discussed uh, in the media, and I, I don't know why that is, but it's... Oh, I think we could guess. Yeah, we probably could. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was uh, telling Mike ahead of time here that... That I was uh, trying to get on a uh, show in San Diego, and I won't name the show for fear of embarrassment. But, right. Uh, the uh, the producer for the show, who was very nice, told me he finally got the co-host, uh, got the host to talk about it, and the, and the host said he didn't want to discuss it on air because it was quote unquote too sensitive. And uh, to me, that's the reason to discuss it, not to mm. right shuttle it aside. But the book is about what I call wacky thinking, and it's uh, the strategy that I've devised is called making up crap. And crap being de defined as silliness, nonsense, absurdity, things that have no foundation in reality. And the thesis is that if you can, if you can get your children, whom you know better than anyone else, you right. know all their nuances, all their life experiences, if you can get them to take the silly things, their, their goofy kinds of ideas, and associate those with things they're trying to learn, the attachment is powerful. It's, it's very powerful powerful. Uh, I can give you one example if, if we have the time uh, uh, of, of just making up crap. Yeah. And it has to do with my going back to my university, Michigan State University, one spring day and I was driving onto the campus. And uh, uh, this has to do, by the way, with remembering the part of the brain that is associated with, with memory, how we memorize and remember things, the right. parts of the brain. So I was driving onto campus. I was stopped. I was sitting there. A bunch of cars were stopped. Then all of a sudden they were stopped in both directions and I felt my car lurch and a hippopotamus walked past my car onto the university campus and then it lurched the other direction and on the other side there was a second hippopotamus that walked by onto the campus and it was just astonishing until I realized that Michigan State University is the center of, of learning and where people go to remember things. Right. A hippopotamus is a pachyderm like the elephant. They have terrific memories and so all of a sudden it struck me that Michigan State University must be the, the hippo campus. And the hippocampus is the Latin word for the two structures in your brain for memory. Right. Now, that's just nonsense. It never happened. Right. But, and it's kind of crap. It's silly. It's mm -hmm. nonsensical. No foundation reality. But you won't forget it, nor will any of your listening audience, because of the way they learned it. And a practical application for what you're talking about is that kids freeze up when they go to take a test. That's right. And so you're saying that if they use this, they're going to have a, 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 an easier time 
remembering. Yes. And the reason for that is fundamentally that we are not uh, uh, we are not created by God as linguistic organisms, as word oriented. We're created as physical, visual, and emotional. Right. So if you can, like you just referenced, if you can attach those three to a concept, they're natural. You're not trying to reach for a word. The word just comes to you because of the physical, visual, and emotional impact in the way you learned it. What you learn is largely related to how you learned it, how much you can learn. So the way you learn uh, is really physical, visual, and emotional, and that's that's the central thesis in the book, but there's quite a bit more in terms of helping parents help their kids. Sounds really pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool <laughs> stuff. Any, any, uh, and we're talking about kids today, too. I mean, things change pretty dramatically. If you think about it, I mean, years ago, the average parents, I mean, there was a mom waiting from when they come mm-hmm. home from school. Now, if there's a mom and dad even living together, they're both at work. Yeah. The kids, the last thing they do before they go to sleep is check their, their social media. The first thing they do before they use the restroom when they wake up is check their social media. Then they hit school and they come home. No one's waiting for them except for social media. Mm -hmm. So parents are, and this is just for you to play with in your head too, is parents are spending between two and 10 minutes with 13 year old kids up. Yeah. Parents have become surrogates almost. They're not. Right. Uh, they're not the main players anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I was kind of smiling when you said uh, when you came home from school because my mom was there all the time. Oh, Your, yeah. Yours probably was. Yes. And uh, it's just a different world. And it's, it, we can bemoan that, but it is what it is. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, the the time that parents have to spend with their children at home though can be very instructive in terms of helping them learn. That's what. That's why I said this. I want to. Yeah. That's. It, it's yeah. so important for parents to hear this. That. Kids, kids learn from you, or they learn from somewhere else. That's right, and and we'd sure rather they learn from home than have to fall into that other way. So, and you you also just mentioned something that Carrie talks about from time to time, and that is that he, Carrie talks to a lot of youth, a lot of a lot of assemblies and such like that. And you and you've said time and time again, Carrie used to be when you asked kids who were the most important people in their in their life, it was their family. Not anymore. Now, when I say what's the most and who's the most important, it's always going to be friends. Used to be family, parents. I thought, you know, now it's changed dramatically. And as a society, we need to take a look at that. We need to look that we're not spending enough time with our children. And there's three categories of kids. Category number one, no matter what kind of a dad you are, your kid's high risk. High maintenance is going to get himself in trouble no matter what. Really have to structure that kid. That's the smallest category. Next category, no matter what kind of a dad you are, your kids are level-headed kids. They want to be a principal or a cop or a lawyer or a doctor, and they're going to get there. The next level, the highest category to me, I really believe this is the biggest category, is the fence sitters. They're going to do what the peer pressure takes them to do. If there's a lot of family involvement, if there's dinners and teaching and stuff like that and outings, they're going to—they're not going to really want to make too many mistakes out there. Mm-hmm. Those are the kids we're losing right now because they're not spending that time with their family. Wow. They're now learning over there, and they're following those kids. Mm-hmm. Wow. If I could put in one plug, uh, part of the book title is uh, sp- has to do with sports psychology, mm-hmm. and there is a terrific parallel between the skills that one applies in, on the sp- sports field right. and what are w- those same skills that are needed for learning. Uh, I take seven of those ideal performance state, uh, what are called IPS skills that athletes use, and I show how they apply to learning, and they're one-to-one. Awesome. And when we come back, we don't want to hear, we're going to take a break, but we want to hear whatever you want to tell us about that book, because now you got me completely <laughs> interested in it. This is Families in Action on our hometown station, AM 1220 KHTS. We'll be right back. 1220, your hometown station. And we're here today with our special guest, Richard Giordano. Richard, besides writing a book, you also, as I say, you talk about Marijuana and the teenage brain, which is something we look at here very often. Ta- Carrie talks about it a lot. It's great to have kind of another voice in here. Mm, and the other thing that I'm hoping you can talk to us a little bit about, since you're from Colorado, we were talking before we went on the air, and you were saying that Colorado is a bit of a mess with this yeah, that, legalized yeah, marijuana. I, I, th- I really think it is from my experiences. Uh, and I, obviously, I'm not in uh, downtown Denver smoking with the, uh, uh, the dope heads. And it's called dope for a reason. 
Yeah. Uh, if you if you talk to those people for a while, you'll realize the reason. Um, and and you know it. it, it I, I, everyone has a right to be stupid. Uh, it's a choice. Um, but John Wayne said, uh, "Life is hard. It's harder if you're stupid." <laughs> uh, and that's very it's always true. good to quote the Duke. It is. It's, it, yes, it is. Especially in California. Yeah. <laughs> But my my interest, uh, frankly, is as an educator. I'm I'm not a I'm not an authority on marijuana by any means, but I do read, and uh, I, a lot of what I read is very frightening to me as far as what it's doing to the young people that I have sought in my career to educate, and in many cases it's made them uneducable, and that's that's the, what I'd like to talk a little bit about today. Please, please. Uh, there's a process. This is from the Journal of Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience. Science. So this is uh, uh, right in the field of Dr. Benjamin Carson, who is a pediatric neurosurgeon. And one of the things that happens to the brain, let's talk about uh, prior to birth. In the first six weeks mm-hmm. uh, of uh, gestation, there is a process called gyrification, which is, as you probably know, the internal, the, if you lifted up the dura mater under the skull and you saw the brain, it's not a smooth surface. Right. It's a convoluted surface, just like draperies. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that, uh, if we can project a reason on what how we were made, is there's a lot more surface area per square inch in a folded substance than there is in a flat substance. The gyrification process starts about six weeks into the gestation process. In the third trimester, it's very active. In other words, the folding of the brain, the amount of neurology in the brain available to do uh, a mental functioning right. is determined then. And then another area of of time, a period of time, is between the ages of 6 and roughly 22. Uh, they're not fixed uh, numbers, but that's what's called a sensitive period when there's another surge in this gyrification process. And could, could actually go up to the mid-20s, couldn't it? It could. Uh, again, this uh, the, the science at this point is always in a stage of becoming. Mm-hmm. And so what we know today, tomorrow we'll think, oh, we thought that. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, right now, it's perceived that, yeah, into the mid-20s, it's a little bit flexible. But the degree of gyrification is directly related to uh, how well you will do in, in per, what performing what are called executive functions. Right. And let me just list off eight of those for you, uh, and you'll get an idea as to why why I'm concerned about this in terms of the education of young people. Uh, all, you, all you parents better be listening to this. Well, this is Take notes. this is such critical information. Yes, uh, and it, it's all available online, and and then more so. But some of the executive functions are impulse control emotional control, flexible thinking. And this is the one that is most directly impacting my the, what I put in my book, uh, working memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, self-monitoring, that's, that's self-control, knowing where you are, what you're doing, and how right. people, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, planning, uh, task initiation, and organization. All of those are fundamental to learning content information. And one of the reasons that I'm so concerned about this, because everything I wrote in my book about strategies for learning becomes reduced in terms of the power if these functions, these executive functions are are halted or not halted, but uh, but they're slowed down, they're reduced because the gyrification in the brain has been reduced. There isn't any solid evidence that it's permanent, but there isn't any solid evidence that it isn't permanent. Exactly. And that's what I've been saying forever. I mean, we know that we have short-term issues, with, especially with children, with, with drugs. Mm-hmm. Is it long-term? We don't know for sure, but I tell you what, I sure can see just in adolescence now, the short-term memory. Why don't you do your homework? I forgot. Why don't you turn it in? I forgot. Their motivation gone. Why don't you like baseball? It's just boring. What's wrong with dance? I don't like it anymore. Mm. As soon as we get them off the pot, and then a couple months later, they start getting their interest back. Yeah. And you just identified some of the things parents, as you know, and I'm sure your audience knows, things to look for in your children. Of course. Uh, that are kind of the tipping, tip-off points. But uh, the concern that I have about this whole issue, uh, knowing that the damage is absolutely there, uh, and it does occur, is that I think we may be we may be seeing the beginnings of an entirely new generation of young people who 
are unable to learn for biologic, right. neurological reasons, as opposed to things that can be treatable, like ADD or, yes. or things of that nature. And if we, if we produce that as a society and it proliferates, it becomes greater, just think of national productivity, national health, mm -hmm. uh, national wellness, uh, the entire nation's uh, future. This is going to sound too, perhaps a bit alarmist, but I think there is an alarm. I do too. It's in danger. I agree with you. you know. Well, look at I've the, been saying this. Well, I was just going to say the, the this whole overdose business of people dying because that's so rampant now. Our our lifespan has mm -hmm. actually been shortened mm -hmm. for the first time in forever. I they guess. dropped the lifespan in America. Yeah. yeah. Well, not only the lifespan, but the quality of. Right? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, that they haven't even talked about. Well, yeah, because we work in the behavioral health unit, and boy, we see some people that have really done it to themselves. Yeah. I was in a McDonald's. Uh, this morning over in Ventura that and I it, it's really troubling for me when I'm in in those coastal cities and I see the, the number of homeless people who are yes. dysfunctional and there was a guy that came in there who looked to be in his 30s and you know today you can walk down the street and it looks like someone's talking to themselves but they actually have an earpiece and they're on yes. their their right. mobile device <laughs> this guy was talking to himself and he had various conversations about uh, uh, power tools and being on trains and walking dogs and I looked at him and I realized he doesn't have an earpiece. Mm -hmm. He was participating vocally in a conversation he was having mentally. We we see that all the time, Richard. Do you? We, well, we work in a... Not in studio, I'm no. saying. No. Okay. In a behavioral well, I, health unit. <laughs> the normal born off isn't in today. And, and unfortunately, <laughs> when they come sometimes to my drug rehabs, we have to transfer them to a behavioral health unit because they're so psychotic. Yeah. And a lot of times, the only thing we're finding in the drug test is THC. Yeah. So it's it's really, as you would say, alarming right now. But you tell that to people out there that are smoking pot, they just can't believe it. No. Well, I see it. Well, it, and the THC, you just mentioned that, that uh, if I mispronounce this, you'll correct me, but uh, tetrahydrocannabinol is the psychotropic part. Harry says that every day. Yeah, and the CBD, <laughs> uh, cannabidi cannabidiol, is the medicinal part. And interestingly, in 1995, the T THC levels were 14 yes. times the CBD, but in 2014, they're 80 times yeah, it's, the it's, CBD. It's off the hook right now. Yeah. So... so so, yeah. So what do you say? Well, I think what I'm saying is that uh, there's a greater danger here than, than uh, the media uh, have led us to believe. Uh, one of, I, I write some public service announcements for uh, the Crawford Broadcasting Company, right. and, um, and they're broadcast in their networks across the country. And one of them says, starts out with saying, uh, the tobacco industry lied to you about the dangers of tobacco and marijuana industry big money backed is lying to you also yes and uh, if if that message is lost on parents uh, then it becomes lost on their children and the loss is societal it's lost yeah we get parents they're calling us every day what's in my drug what's in my kids drug test and we go whoa 800 milligrams thc now a year ago that was panic for the parent and they ran and they brought them to us and we got them sober now is that's it okay thank you click mm. so it's it's kind of one of those kind of things as a society we gave up on pot yeah and our kids are going to pay big prices i'm already seeing it but it's going to get worse and we and well the other thing we see in the behavioral health unit is there are people coming in who only have marijuana in their bloodstream yet they're psychotic Mm. They they are actually in our unit. I've got emails from Simi Valley Police Department, a place in Texas and another couple of states with the same information. We're finding people in, me in mental health, behavioral health units that are psychotic, drug-induced, but the only thing showing is THC. Yeah. And now, you we'll tell that to somebody that's out there smoking pot, and they'll give you 500 reasons why that can't be. That well, can't be. it is B. I see it. We're there. We see it. We know what's happening. And and our doctors are very good at uh, looking at the blood screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the blood tests don't lie. Yeah. 
Oh, and, the, and neither of the psychotic behaviors. So what you were saying earlier, what was what was the word you used for the folds in the brain? The, it's, it's called a gyrification. Gyrification. I, so yeah. I had a question on you. Sure, go ahead. So if Carrie and I went and got pictures of our brains and mine had more folds in it, that would be better. <laughs> Uh, theoretic, theoretically, yes, okay. theoretically. I just wanted to check. Well, and one of the, one of the ways that I like to really describe this, so that uh, Garrison Keillor has a saying. He says, "Let's put the hay down where the goats can get it." Mm-hmm. And what, the way I like to describe gyrification is if you can picture a, a nine foot picture window at the front of your house that has draperies that close and open. When the draperies are closed, there's a there's a huge flat surface. Right. And when the draperies are open, maybe they're they're pleated on each side, maybe a, a foot and a half each. So really what you've got is a nine foot service surface compressed into one and a half foot, one and a half foot, three foot total. Now that's what that's the gyrification, the, the peaks and the valleys in your cerebral material, the gray matter. So, so you to speak. put more in a smaller package. Exactly right. And of course you only have a certain amount of room inside your head. Mm-hmm. And so a flat surface would not be nearly as good as, as a uh, gyrific surface. That's right. interesting. Yeah. And the, the, the surface on all those folds are, are the neurons. Picture them as little dots, if you will, and interconnections through their uh, synaptic connections and the neurology of it. But, but the more neurology, the greater the capacity to perform in the prefrontal cortex, those executive functions that I listed. So for all- and where does, TH, where does THC store? In the brain. Your fatty cells. Yeah. Oh, well, which is everywhere, including the brain. And I'm not even going to get into a, any kind of debate about adults and pot and marijuana. You're adults. Make your own decisions. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to adolescence with a brain that is not developed yet, we're really asking for trouble when we say it's just pot. Yeah. We're really asking for trouble. And the ones that are really going to pay the price for us not doing anything is our children. Mm-hmm. That's pretty scary. And they can't make those decisions. I mean, their brain is not developed enough to make those kinds of decisions properly. Yeah, and, and I think there's been a movement. I've seen the movement in education in terms of t- parents I've talked with, and unfortunately, even some teachers that that want to give more and more authority to young people when they're not ready for that authority. Right. Somehow it's an ingratiating thing that the teacher or the parent feels like they'll like them better or they'll be their friends. And, you know, it's nice if your kids are your friends, but that's not your purpose as a parent you're their parent uh, first yeah i think so yeah i know carrie so. this is great and you I've, keep seconding things I, you I, say I, here I, all the time well, we, say, we talk yeah, about yeah. that all the time we be are their parent now be their friend later right. it's when, nice to have a different voice come in and say that isn't yeah, it yeah, we, yeah. we're here mirroring everything we're like right on and the I, same and, you know, page. In, in, the inter- in the interest of full disclosure i'm not a parent mm-hmm. i never have been a parent right. and you don't play one on television i don't play one on television but i've i've talked with enough of them and i when i when i came to colorado i went to colorado I, was, I think I'm in Colorado now. I'm actually in California, but mm. uh, this is California. Yeah, yes. yeah. But I came from Michigan, uh, and where I was a principal, and I went into Telluride, Colorado, which is a uh, at that time in 1979 was a kind of a mountain hippie yeah. ski area. It's hugely developed now. They have uh, the big uh, film festival there. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I'll tell you, you don't want to be there. Uh, uh, you can get high just walking down the street. <laughs> uh, it, but that was an area that had a tremendous amount of drugs, and then I was with. With, uh, I was in Durango, Colorado, the Durango Silverton train. A lot of people know about that. Right. And then I went to Boulder Valley, which is Boulder, Colorado, which is another hot spot for drugs. And I was at their mountain school, which is in Nederland. Terrific amount of abusiveness, a lot of drug usage, a lot of dysfunction. Uh, it is a very, very endemic, epidemic circumstance in our country now. Yes. Well, California, guys, I know that L.A. is putting a, a, a halt on it and Santa Clarita is putting a halt on it but it's legal here. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you one thing. I, I know that the police, even though it's federal, um, still a crime, the police yeah. aren't going to do anything about it because yeah. what are you going to do? It's legal. So we are in the midst of a real headache when it comes to adolescence, children. That's right. And this drug. I, in general, we are, but I'm, I'm just going to yeah. say kids because that's what scares me the most. And that's right our children. And as uh, Richard was saying, that puts our society at risk. That absolutely does. Big time. I think it really does. And, uh, you know, the issue of uh, legality to me is a non-starter because you know, people that I talk to that raise that, I, I my comment is usually uh, along the lines of, 
what great comfort is there to know that you're legally becoming dysfunctional in terms of your capacity yeah. to think as a human being? <laughs> that it's legal. So, but what comfort is it that it's legal? So it's legal. Let me ask you guys a question out there. Think this through. Would you like to get on an airplane with a pilot that just took eight bong hits? Mm. Or ate three three edible brownies, would you? Would you like to go into war with with the people that are next to you in a fight that just ate some high grade marijuana mm -hmm. or THC? I don't think I would. Would you want our cops driving around loaded? It's legal. Mm. Why not? Well, and that's not the only thing. And this is, I think this is part of your book, or at least it's part of a press release about your book. A recent study of the math, reading, and science skills of 15-year-olds by Program International for Student Assessment, PISA, found that American students ranked 25th in the inter, inter, industrialized world, trailing China, Singapore, and Japan. Mm. Wow. Yeah. We've in this we've in this country for decades now had this uh, kind of euphoric delusion that uh, American education is the top of the pile. Mm. Uh, having been there, done that, I can tell you uh, from having dealt with the people on the ground who are doing the teaching, and there are many good public school teachers. Yes, uh, but it is not uh, what a lot of people believe it to be. And there are lots of reasons for that. I did a program in uh, a radio program for an hour in Colorado talking about the fraud, the absolute fraud of um, teacher evaluation, how it, it, it in fact cannot be done. It's done by principals. Right. And principals, I was one of them, principals are incompetent to evaluate their secondary school teachers for sure. I can guarantee it, and I gave the reasons and rationale why that's true. But, mm -hmm. but most parents believe that teachers are evaluated and they're there in the classroom because because they were evaluated to be effective mm -hmm. is not true. Hmm. I want to hear more about the book. We only got about 15 minutes, and I'm, I'm dying to hear more about what's <laughs> going on in this so I can pick up one. Yeah, especially because it says the wacky thinking. I know you get it. It's, it's yeah. wacky thinking. The sports psychology, making it happen. That's interesting that you can incorporate those. Yeah. Well, and I part of the research for the book, actually the book was not a planned venture. It, it kind of arose out of the work that I did with uh, university athletes. Uh, I was, I was saying, telling you earlier, Mike, that I worked at uh, every major university, Division One for sure and two, has a, an academic wing that works just with the athletes across all of the sports to keep them eligible and right. to help them matriculate to graduate. Right. And I was brought into some universities, Notre Dame, Indiana University, and a, a couple of others, uh, three or four others, to present my program in a three or four day period with their university elite athletes to teach them the skills that then became a part of, uh, of the book that you have here. And uh, so the book is an outgrowth of the actual field training process, uh, field work process with these, these athletes. And what came to me is uh, Notre Dame, for example, uh, not, not particularly more so than others, but university athletes are extremely skilled and powerful. They're the, mm -hmm. they're, to get a to, I work with University of Notre Dame football, incoming freshmen, uh, and they are extremely valuable valuable people. They're oh, yeah. paid a lot of money to go to that school and there's a lot mm -hmm. on the line. And so they need to perform in on the field and in the classroom. Right. So uh, that's, but they're very wacky. They have the most bizarre senses of humor and they're a bunch of crazy. They're just high school seniors a few months later. Yes. And I know high school. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> they're still kids. They're still kids. That's right. Yeah. They're big bodies when you see them on television or on the field. Right. But they're still kids. Yeah. Yep. That they are. Hey, Mike. Wow. Well, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with our special guest, uh, Richard Giordano. And this is Families in Action here on KHTS AM 1220, your hometown station. Be right back. Welcome back to Families in Action on your hometown station, AM 1220 KHTS. I'm Kerry Quashen along with Michael Doherty, my co-host. We thank you so much for listening. What, Michael? Hey, I just wanted to let our listeners know this is very important. You're going to be on television tonight. Actually, no, I'm not. I, not? I, was in a, I was somewhere else, so I couldn't do that. I misspoke. I thought uh, it was no, you. No, actually, it's going to be some of our action kids okay. talking about marijuana and that they were addicted to the non-addictive drug. And one of my counselors, Sharon um, Holiday, will be on. In my place, I couldn't do the interview. Okay. But it'll be on tonight, Channel 7, Eyewitness News, if I 45 is one of theirs. Well, it's still worth watching. Yeah, you'll learn a lot about marijuana. You'll <laughs> learn a lot about Richard, what Richard was just saying. <laughs> so, Richard, you know what? We only have a few more minutes. You came from sure. Colorado to join us. 
It's your show. Take it over. Where do you want to go? Well, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to talk with you gentlemen and also reach your audience because I think these are, well, you think as well as I that these are important issues. Of course. Uh, if I could just make a few comments more about the book, uh, uh, just so that people will know that it is available at Amazon uh, and it's supercharged learning. Now I'm going to, you know, for our, for our um, uh YouTube. Oh, of and course. I didn't have the, I'll, I'll hold this up so they can see it. There you go. We're going to hold it up. So you're going to check this out on YouTube. There it is. You go on, Richard. Well, I, the, the book is the book premise is uh, that parents can be hugely impactful in their children's education. And I'd like to allay one of the concerns that many people think, many parents think about when they're trying to get involved, particularly at the secondary level, where all these subjects are, physics, right. chemistry, biology, language arts, which we used to call English, by the way, right. Uh, right. Uh, foreign language. The book premise is, and it's founded in reality, is that you do not have to know a thing about those subjects in order to help your children in those subjects. That's a relief for a lot of parents. Well, it has to be. And I think it's one of the preclusive things that many times parents think, well, I can't help my child learn biology because I didn't do well in biology right. or I never had and I biology. hear that all the time. Actually. Sure. Yes. But, but the book premise is taking what you know about your child, your student, all the nuances of their, their people, places and things of their lives and helping them attach those to the things they're trying to learn. Like if I were, if I happen to be a parent that didn't know that the hippocampus was the part of the brain that was responsible for memory where right. it all started. But I knew that the term was hippocampus. I could say to my child, well, why don't you think of a hippopotamus walking onto a campus? Mm -hmm. See, I don't know anything about hippocampus, but the lock is immediate because of the association. That works. And the other thing I tried to do... Uh, works in the, for me. Yeah, it, it works for... It, it's, yeah. it's natural because yeah. you're just physical, visual, and emotional. Right, right. Uh, thinking takes effort. Emotion just happens. Right. It's part of who we are as our God-given gift. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I tried to do in the book is take sports because we're such a sports-oriented society. Right. And I take elite athletes that I worked with and I show how they use these seven ideal performance state qualities to perform on the field. And I show how those, I go through each one of them in the book, and I show how, for example, the, the issue of focus is used on the field. A, a, a university athlete playing at, let's say, at Michigan State's playing University of Michigan in the Spartan Stadium, there's 80-some thousand people in that stadium screaming. Right. The players on the field, once they take the first few hits, they don't know they're there. They don't even hear them because right. they are so focused. Now, that same focus is what's needed in a classroom situation, listening to instructors, or in an individual study session where you're trying to focus on something you need to read. Right. So the focus aspect that an athlete uses is the same focus aspect that a student uses. I have my own example of how this works. Okay. It just came to my mind. This, okay. is, this is amazing. I'm dying to hear When this. I was a young boy, <laughs> spelling was not my big thing. Long time ago. But yeah, that was a while back for me. But it, uh, watching a Walt Disney show, mm -hmm. Jiminy Cricket, mm -hmm. he was doing a show and he was talking about the encyclopedia and he sang the following song, E-N-C-Y-C-L-O-P-E-D-I-A. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned to spell encyclopedia. And when I was in school and it came up, I was so proud of myself. I had to cover my mouth so I didn't sing it out loud, right? But I <laughs> sang it in my that's mind, right. E-N-C-Y-C-L-O-P-E-D-I-A. Yeah. Well, I see, that's an example, really, in my context of making up crap. It's just, it's not real. It's it, it's made up. Mm -hmm. But it works. But it works. It works. So there are skills that uh, I, I had. There's a, there's a wonderful concert pianist, uh, Emil. Pandolfi, who, if your listeners want some wonderful uh, music and all um, music, Broadway, uh, classics, whatever, Emil Pandolfi has a lot of CDs. Uh, I got to know him and I asked him if he would write uh, about the seven ideal performance states, not as an athlete, right. but as a performer. And then as a student, how they apply. And he wrote in, in the book are his uh, renditions of how
how he applies in practice and in performance, which is equivalent to in study and in the classroom, how he applies those IPS strategies, uh, one of which is to be relaxed and calm. Uh, you cannot go out on a field and play football and do your best to read the defense, for example, if you're too tense that you're not seeing things properly. Uh, mm-hmm. So relaxed and calm is another issue. Uh, uh, confidence is something that you can have only if you've earned it. Right. Uh, you can't be confident going into taking a test if you haven't prepared for the test. Mm-hmm. So all of these seven issues, there, there are uh, five more, five or four or five more. That and are they involved. are in your book. They are in the book. They're all outlined as to how they apply ath- athletics, how they apply in academics. Now, I have how, to ask question. Uh, how does question somebody get that book? Oh, yeah. Uh, how does somebody that get that book? I think the best price is at still Amazon.com. Yeah, of course. Uh, Amazon, and the name of the book again. Supercharged Learning, How Wacky Thinking and Sports Psychology Make It Happen. Say it again so people can write this. Supercharged Learning, How Wacky Thinking and Sports Psychology Make It Happen. I just had a thought, Kerry, you know, when he was that's, talking that's about scary, what you Mike. need. To, yeah, it is. <laughs> when, when, when he was talking about what you need, when athletes need when they go out on the field, immediately I remembered that's exactly what you did, right, when you threw out the first pitch at Daughters. Oh, that State. was pretty That was pretty cool. That's right. I got to throw out the first you pitch got it, a few You got it over ago. the plate, right? I did. It went right over the plate, and it was caught. It Amazing. didn't hit the ground. Now, I did practice. Like you said, I came prepared, so I was confident go. it would happen. That's, that's uh, key. That's I went key. to the park for a week and threw that ball just to make sure. It would go over that plate because that would be Very pretty good. embarrassing if it didn't. The whole world. <laughs> Richard, again, thank you for coming. We sure appreciate it. My we pleasure. have to close, but I want you to say the name of that book and you can get it on <laughs> Amazon.com one more time. Supercharged Learning, How Wacky Thinking and Sports Psychology Make It Happen. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. This, this is Families in Action, Mike, on our hometown station, AM 1220. KHCS, don't you want to say happy Monday? Happy, happy Monday, and be careful. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day, guys. Remember what you got to do. That's right. Till next week. Bye.